the other night, um, I got to watch a movie all the way through that I've never seen all the way through before. And the name of that movie was The Da Vinci Code. Oh, um, Good movie, not very factual, but a good movie nevertheless. In the movie, the villain, so to speak, the bad guy, who was not Tom Hanks. The bad guy in the movie is the one who tries to prove that Jesus was just an ordinary human. That there was no divinity at all in Jesus Christ. And that the church has been telling a 2,000 year old lie so that it can prop itself up in its power. As Ebenezer Scrooge was heard to mutter, ah, humbug. Yes? Still, we live in a scientific age. We live in an empirical age where we want proof that something really did happen and that it couldn't possibly happen. It couldn't possibly have happened the way that our little manger scene on the altar says it happened, or the way that it happened in our, our new manger scene off to the side here. And yet, tonight, if Christmas is going to have any effect on our world, if in fact there really is a light that can go into the world, then some things must be said. Some things must be held. First of all, you will find a copy of the Da Vinci Code in the fiction section of the library. It is not in the biography section. It is not in the historical section. It is in the fiction section. It's good reading, and a lot of people have actually, Roswell Chapel is swamped now with millions of visitors every year in Scotland because that's where Mary Magdalene's body was supposed to lay. And uh, the, the uh, Da Vinci Code postulates that Mary Magdalene was the Holy Grail because she carried Jesus as a child. Mm -hmm. um, and since that was published, Roswell Chapel had, had, the, had, had been swamped by people in the Priory of Sion in France has been swamped with with uh, many tourists who believe would believe that, but not attend a candlelight service to worship Jesus Christ. If the light is going to go into the world tonight, if the Word is to truly become flesh in our world tonight, this Christmas, then there are some things that have to be true. And one of them is that the Son of God has to be born to Bethlehem. It has to be true. If Jesus was not born divine and human at the same time, then if Jesus is just human, there's no reason to celebrate. He was a great guy. He was a good teacher, but he wasn't divine. And therefore is incapable of saving us, is incapable of uh, giving us eternal life, or giving us the hope, the peace, the joy, the love that those candles symbolize. So if I'm going to be the Word that becomes flesh tonight in this world, I have to go out here believing that the Word became flesh. That Jesus was there in the beginning, as John says, and that not one thing that was made was made without Jesus being there. And that Jesus is truly God become flesh in the world that we live in and that Jesus lived in. It's the only reason I could ever find to worship Jesus Christ is if I knew that he was both fully human. I want Jesus to be fully human because if Jesus isn't fully human, I have a God who doesn't understand me. Amen? Jesus knew what it was like to be 
human. He suffered. He was tempted. He bled. He died. All of those things. And yet he was divine as well. Because when he was tempted, he didn't give in to it. When he suffered, he overcame it with his faith. And he was resurrected on the third day as well. And so we worship this person who was this, this person God, who was, who was born in Bethlehem, as the prophecy said, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us so that God could stay, I know you, I know you, because I bore your flesh. I know exactly what you walked through. Because I walked it for 33 years. I walked the earth. So at first, I have to believe the story of Christmas. I have to believe it's true. And I do. I do believe the story of Christmas is true. But then I have to allow that story to change me. It has to change me in some way. To believe that the person who was born in the manger in Bethlehem was truly divine. It has to change me. It has to change the way that I look at my world and the way I look at my neighbor and even the way that I look at myself. All of us tonight are innkeepers. Every single one of us tonight are innkeepers and what we have to decide is, is there room in the inn for Christ? And our inn in the end that we keep. Is there room for Jesus there? The fully human Jesus. The fully divine Jesus. Is there room for Jesus to be Lord of our lives? Is there room for that baby to rule? Mary and Joseph went on a journey. And while they were on that journey, she delivered Jesus. They went to Bethlehem because they were ordered to go there by an earthly power. And yet they also went there believing in a divine mission that they had. They lived in both of those worlds. And so do we, don't we? We live in both the secular world and we live in the world of the divine one. The secular world says there's no room in the end. There's no room in the inn because everyone came to Bethlehem to be taxed. But we can make room in the inn, yes? Even though there's many things that tax us. Worries, fears, disillusions, whatever it might be. Still, we can make room in the inn. We are all that, we are all those innkeepers. And what we have to decide, is there room in the inn tonight for the child that was born in Bethlehem? If there isn't, we can't become disciples. We can't become followers of the one that we won't make room for. Does that make sense? We can't become followers of the one that we have no room for in our lives. We can push things out. There's so many, our schedules and, and um, all of the things that we have to do. We run here and there. Even in the ministry, you know, sometimes we get so busy in ministry, we forget we're doing Jesus. It get, I can tell you right now, I am going to sleep when I come home from here tonight. <laughs> it has been busy since we registered those folks, uh, those 60 families for Christmas. Mm -hmm. I have been running where Jesus walked um, for about a month, uh, two months now, and sometimes we got so busy worrying if we were going to have enough for everyone that we forgot that it's Jesus who does the fish and the loaves, amen? It's Jesus who, and that's what it means to make room for Christ, to make room for Christ to be divine in our lives and to work in our lives. We thought we were going to run out to remember that he's the one that does the fish and the loaves. He's the one that brings about the blessings. 
And as the season went on and more and more people requested to be helped for Christmas, more and more came into this church so that we could help. No one was turned away. Absolutely no one was turned away. And I believe that is because there are people in this church and people in the world who like the Unlike the innkeeper said, yes, there's room for Jesus to work in my life, to spread that love and that, that feeling of charity. And so if we would make room for Jesus, then we might be Jesus' disciples. We might be the ones then who, as we go off disciples, become the voice of Jesus, the voice of Jesus. Jesus only has a voice if you're willing to speak about Jesus. Amen? Amen. Very rarely is Jesus going to appear. I mean, sometimes people hold up a potato chip and it's got the image of Christ on it, but I think there's something psychological about that. I, you know, we become Jesus' voice when we make room for Jesus in our inn. When Jesus begins to work in us and we begin to follow that inner voice that where God calls us to be faithful disciples, then we become the voice of Jesus. What other voice does Jesus have but our voices this Christmas? The voice that proclaims the birth, the hope of the birth, and those four attributes of Christ that we've been talking about, hope and peace and joy and love. Who's going to pro proclaim it if it isn't you and I? Who's going to do it? It's part of our call as Jesus' disciples, as we make room for Christ, as we begin to follow Christ, that we become His voice, and we become His feet. There are many, many places that Jesus needs to go in this world. There are many places where people are hurting, where people need to know peace, where people need to know love, where people need to know joy. There are places that Jesus needs to go, and He goes upon our feet. Jesus walks where we walk. How many times have I told you in the congregation over the last 24 years that whatever step you take, Jesus takes with you? That the only time that we're separated from God is when we choose to separate ourselves from God. God never chooses to separate God's self from us. And so we become the feet of Jesus and we become Jesus' hands to do the work of the realm of God. To do that work. To do the ministry which Jesus puts in our hands. Now we all have different talents. We all, we all have different talents. I can't play the piano. But this woman becomes Jesus' hands on the keyboard. Amen? Amen. She becomes Jesus' hands. Mindy can carry a tune far better than me. I guarantee you. That's why she becomes Jesus' voice tonight. You don't want to hear me sing Oh Holy Night. Um, believe me, not as a solo winning. I'll sing with you anyway, but be glad I can sing solo. She became the voice of Jesus Christ tonight. Amen. Do you see? When we get in donations and our volunteers are up there sorting or they're making boxes of food to hand out, or when we're holding someone's hand and praying for them when they need prayer, we become Jesus' hands. We do all of these things. We make the Word become flesh in the world these days. We make Christmas real and alive. If we believe the story. If we really believe that there was one, one Jesus who was born into this world, who was fully human and fully divine at the same time, Capable of understanding us and capable of saving us all at the same time. And believing that story made room for that baby to be born in us. To live in us in a real way so that we could feel the urging of that baby in us. Hear, call to be disciples. That baby that matures in faith in their hearts and says, follow me. And so we become disciples. So that as we live out our discipleship, 
we can become the voice and the hands and the feet of Jesus in this world. That is how the Word becomes flesh again. That is how the Jesus of the Christmas story lives again and again and again and again. Until Jesus returns, we are the people Jesus had to do Jesus' work. I encourage you this night. Make room in the end once again. Let the child be born in you again, newly, this night. So that your discipleship will be refreshed. And you will speak about Jesus with a, with a newly excited voice. And your feet will dare to go where maybe they haven't gone before because Jesus is leading them. And your hands will dare to do the work that maybe you thought you couldn't do. Um, before this night, you be the word that becomes blood. In Jesus' name.